Uh, dear friends, uh, dear colleagues, uh, I uh, know that it, many of you don't work on a daily basis on energy issues uh, like uh, uh, we do, like I do. So perhaps a few things about the, I start with the International Energy Agency. We are uh, based in uh, uh, Paris and we are an intergovernment organization and the IEA family member governments, uh, uh, some uh, 50 governments, uh, account about 80% of global energy consumption uh, today. And uh, I am very fortunate not only for the data, uh, but also I have, uh, I am working with 400 top uh, energy experts uh, of the world. And one of them uh, is with me, uh, Toril Bosson, a Norwegian uh, colleague who heads our, uh, the oil market uh, uh, division. So research is at the heart of our work. We make uh, research on energy and climate issues. We cover all energy sources, oil, gas, coal, solar, hydrogen, nuclear power, energy efficiency, and related issues such as climate investment and others. But we make research not only for research, but uh, for uh, policy making. Uh, based on our research, we make uh, reports, and the, our reports uh, have, a, if I may say so, have a strong impact on the global international uh, energy and climate uh, debate uh, for international uh, fora and uh, helps the governments, uh, hopefully, to make uh, better uh, decisions. So uh, one of the uh, uh, areas that I put a lot of emphasis after I became the head of this uh, very agency is to be able to give the research results, policy recommendations in a accessible way to the wider public. So it is, uh, I think, important that everybody understands us. We don't make research for research, but research for policy making and changing the world, hopefully in a better uh, way. Today, uh, I would like to take you through some of the global uh, energy and climate issues. As I said, I know that you are not working on a daily basis on these issues, but to give you a, a background information on these uh, topics. So energy is the lifeblood of our economic life, uh, the social life, uh, our uh, uh, prosperity around the, around the world. And uh, decades and decades, uh, our energy system currently is the same, is based on fossil fuels, coal, oil, and natural gas. They are making a big portion of our energy use today around the world. And they help the world to be uh, more prosperous, our lives much more comfortable, and lift uh, millions of people out of poverty uh, around the world, across the world. Uh, this is, of course, a, a, a good news, but the, the bad news is this uh, energy sources, coal, oil, and gas, create a major problem, which is the, uh, the climate change. All these three fossil fuel uh, resources, uh, the, the, the fuels, are responsible about 80% of the emissions causing climate change. And many of you know, many of you follow, it is uh, climate change, climate crisis getting worse and worse uh, by day. And uh, according to the scientists, this year, 2023, will be the hottest year in the history of our planet. Not only the hottest year, but also at the same time, the number of extreme weather events, droughts, floods, and uh, others, are their intensity and their frequency is increasing by day. And therefore, if we want to fix the problem, we have to find a way to use uh, energy without emissions. And here, uh, what helps us, can help us, 
is using energy in a cleaner way, getting the energy sources from clean uh, energy options. Now, when we look at the world, as I said, years and years, decades and decades, the fossil fuels have dominated our world. So uh, some of you may remember, I think many of you uh, know better than me, the Brutland Report, the, the, the sustainability concept was put forward by uh, Madame Brutland. At that time, uh, more than 30 years ago, uh, the, about 80% of our energy system was dominated by fossil fuels, coal, oil and gas. And now when we look at today, that number, 80%, came down to only 78%. So there is more or less uh, no change. And as a result, we are seeing the, the climate crisis. Day by day, we are affected by that. Some parts of the world are affected more than the others. In fact, the, one of the injustices is uh, some regions such as Africa, which is the smallest a, a, a sin or contribution to emissions is affected the worst. So this is something definitely uh, rather uh, unfair. But uh, this is the this is the uh, the climate science, and this is uh, what we are seeing today. But uh, make no mistake, climate change is affecting and will be affecting uh, all of us. So these are uh, varying uh, trends, but there are also, uh, as uh, Madame Minister also mentioned this morning, I explained, at the same time we are seeing a clean energy economy is also emerging. If I can give you a couple of examples, for example, electricity generation. Okay? It has been dominated by coal, well, then, then gas, uh, and also oil sometimes. But now, for example, this year, of all the power plants built in the world, the entire world, more than 80% are renewables. Mainly solar, but also wind, hydropower, uh, bioenergy. And this is happening also because they are becoming cheaper. For example, in terms of solar, it is uh, about 60% of all new power plants are solar uh, power. And this is not uh, China, India, Europe, uh, North America. We are seeing a lot of solar installations because it is the cheapest option. Just, uh, and China is by far, I should say, uh, the uh, leader uh, here. Many of you may know, I'm sure Eric knows, who knows the energy world very well, years and years in the energy world there was a motto. King Coal, Coal is the king. But that king is dying, if not dead already. There is a, a, there is a new queen, this is the solar. Solar is now the queen of the electricity generation around the world. This is one option. The other thing is the, our transportation system. Uh, the cars, which is a main uh, consumer of the uh, oil sector, the, our uh, transportation, the cars, has been dominated by the, we call internal combustion engine cars around the world. But now we are seeing the electric cars, not only in uh, Europe, but around the world. In fact, China again is the leader here, is growing very strongly. Three years ago, uh, one out of 25 cars sold in the world was electric. So one out of 25, three years ago. This year, one out of five cars sold is electric. And in 2030, with the most conservative expectation, one out of two cars sold in the world will be an electric car. Heat pumps. When you want to heat your homes, uh, you have uh, two basic options with heat pumps, and the other one is uh, with the uh, natural gas or oil uh, boilers to heat our homes. And in the last two years, we are seeing that the sales of heat pumps are overtaking the sales of the uh, gas, natural gas-based uh, heating uh, systems across the world. So it is the 
again the Europe, it is North America, Japan, uh, China, and uh, elsewhere. So there are many other examples uh, that I can give you. So we are seeing that the clean energy system is coming through, which in my view is a, a good news. There is a chance, at least a fighting chance, that we can keep the temperature increase at a certain level. What the scientists tell us, in order to have a planet which is more or less like today, the maximum temperature increase we can tolerate is 1.5 degrees Celsius. But with the current trends, which, are, which also include the encouraging some of the numbers I give to you, the temperature increase uh, will be around, according to our analysis uh, research, 2.4 degrees Celsius. So the difference between the 1.5 and 2.4, many of you know better than me, is tremendous. And this will have devastating effects for everybody. Rich, poor, south, north. Some of the countries, some of the regions will be more affected than the uh, others. So I was asked uh, by the colleagues to talk about the, the barriers or enablers on that. So I have chosen uh, three barriers in this clean energy economy emerging and wanted to share uh, these with you before going to your uh, questions and uh, uh, answers. Now, the first one is the very much related to the, the what is happening in the electricity generation. More and more solar and wind, onshore wind, and offshore wind is the economies uh, working on, like uh, many uh, other companies around the world. They are growing. It's a very good news. But there is one big problem. The problem is, this is the first challenge I want to share with you, we don't have in the world the appropriate, adequate uh, level of the grids, the, uh, the electric transmission distribution grids, to bring this uh, solar and wind and the others to the uh, consumers. We have not built them. We forgot to build them. It is something like uh, you are uh, manufacturing the best car in the world, very sustainable, clean energy, looks very nice, the colors, the shape, the model, uh, the, uh, very comfortable, but you forget to build the roads. It's exactly like that. We forget to build the roads. We forget to build the grids. And what is the problem? And why do we need them? Because the solar and wind are very good, but they have a, a one important uh, disadvantage, namely, they may not be every single moment available, it's depending on the, uh, uh, the weather. So the grids, uh, so-called the smart grids, digital grids that we have to build, will be, uh, will be able to help us in order to address this uh, intermittency uh, issue. So just to tell you, I don't want to bother you with a lot of numbers, but in the last 10 years in the world, the amount of investment going to building renewable sources, solar, wind, and the others, multiplied by two, but the amount of investment going to grids was completely flat. It didn't increase. Governments forgot it. And what is happening now, in the entire world, a lot of solar and wind projects are ready, but they are not uh, be able to uh, connect to the grid. There is a queue. They are just ready, and they want to be uh, connected. There is a, a congestion, as we call it, in the grids. And the amount of solar and the wind energy just waiting in the queue, finished projects, are five times more than what we have connected uh, last year. They are just standard, they are waiting there. So uh, one big job for Europe, uh, for many parts in the United States, in Japan, in China, is building grids and uh, uh, bringing the electricity from the new sources of uh, electricity generation to the consumers. So this is the, a big challenge, and without, if we aren't able to do that, 
the the renewable revolution, what we are seeing in the electricity generation, will be uh, rather weak. So this is the first uh, challenge I see in front of us uh, today. The second challenge is the following. <clears throat> when you have an electric car, okay, you do not need oil products, diesel or gasoline, to, to, uh, to, to fuel it. So this is a good uh, news uh, for many of us, not, if not all. But to build the uh, cars and the batteries, you need so-called critical minerals such as lithium, such as cobalt, such as copper. There are several critical minerals which you need to build uh, this uh, electric cars or solar panels or uh, the uh, wind, uh, wind mills. So, and when we look around the world today, where these critical minerals ownership lies and where they are refined to be ready uh, to go to the uh, uh, to the manufacturers, there is a huge, huge concentration. The concentration of the critical minerals uh, mining and refining is much stronger than the oil and gas concentration today. And there is one country which is dominating the game big time, which is China. <coughs> Uh, just let me give you a couple of examples in terms of manufacturing. Uh, today, I mentioned to you solar, for example. 80% of solar panels in the world are manufactured in China. Again, 75% uh, of the batteries, which are very important uh, for the uh, electric cars and uh, other technologies, are uh, uh, manufactured in uh, China. Now, this is, of course, in, in itself, is uh, it's a free market. It is uh, it is not a big problem, but I think uh, this may well be a key challenge because concentration is uh, always bad when it comes to energy. The, for me, the magic word when you talk about energy issues is diversification and not to uh, have an over-reliance on one single country, one single company, one single trade route, because anything can happen. Some countries we have seen use uh, natural gas as a political weapon. This may be one issue. Or there may be an uh, uh, incident. For example, solar panels. A sonar panel, just I don't want to bother you, but they have, we have four different modules, and you bring them together and make the solar panel. And one of the modules uh, are uh, almost 90% of the world uh, manufacturing is happening in uh, China, in uh, one uh, province, in two huge uh, installations and fabrics. If there is a fire in one of them, the entire supply chain across the world will be paralyzed. So this is a, a major issue uh, for the security of uh, the uh, clean energy transition that uh, we, the world, may well rely on one single country if we are not able to diversify the manufacturing and the critical uh, minerals. Many countries are now uh, making efforts for diversification. You might have heard United States has a, a new uh, a major, in fact, uh, program called Inflation Reduction Act, where in the United States, government is giving a lot of subsidies for clean energy technology manufacturing. In Europe, uh, there is a, a program coming to the Europe uh, Net Zero Industry Act, uh, going along the same line. But uh, we see, and currently, a big dominance of one single uh, country. And China, uh, of course, uh, by pushing the solar energy did, uh, uh, and making it manufacturing a lot, not only have the concentration dominance, but China uh, uh, gave a big benefit to the rest of the world. 
and uh, by uh, learning by doing, China brought the cost of solar energy down. It is now very, very cheap. So uh, from that point of view, I'm, uh, 20 years ago, solar was solar generation, solar electricity was a romantic story. And now it is a real business. Everybody is building a solar, and this is also thanks to uh, China. But at the same time, there is a huge concentration in one single country, which may or may not have some uh, consequences, and therefore I consider this as a second uh, important challenge that we are facing today in the clean energy uh, transition. Uh, third and the last challenge, uh, I wanted to also mention this, and for me, this is in fact the, it, our fault line, our fight against climate change, which is the following. A investment for making to, uh, to be able to build solar panels, electric cars, batteries, wind mills, of, you, the most important thing is investment, to uh, put money uh, and uh, to make this, uh, the energy uh, transition happen, uh, we are seeing a lot of growth in the clean energy investment around the world. Just to give you again uh, one number, in 2015, you, uh, many of you know that in Paris there was a, a very important agreement, climate uh, agreement. At that time, the entire world's clean energy investment was about uh, one trillion US dollars. So 2015, it was one trillion clean energy investments. This year, it is uh, reaching close to two trillion US dollars. So from one to two, this is good news. But the problem, the challenge is the following. All this growth, almost one trillion dollar growth in clean energy investment came from rich countries plus China. And the rest of the world, the developing countries in Asia, in Latin America, in Africa, their clean energy investment since Paris didn't increase at all, it's flat. And this is a big problem. Because when you talk about the climate change, I'm sure there are colleagues who know it much better than me here, but the emissions going to atmosphere from Africa or from Latin America, from Asia or from Norway, it is the same effect on everybody. So emissions don't have a passport. If we want to have a world that we reduce the emissions, there is a need for clean energy investment going also to uh, poorer countries. Why investment is not going there? Because investors put their money uh, on projects where, say, where they see the least risk and the highest returns. It's very uh, simple. Nobody makes it for uh, creative reasons, the investors. And the, there are a lot of risks of any project in the developing countries. They range from the country risk uh, to the risk of regulatory risk and other uh, risks. As a result of that, if you want to uh, build a solar panel today in Europe, the same one in Africa, in Africa, is, it costs three times higher because of this risky, considered as a risky one, compared to Europe. In Europe, it is a, there is a much uh, more investment-friendly uh, environment. So how are we going to de-risk the clean energy investment developing countries is, for me, it is the fault line. As a result, we are seeing today a very bizarre, very, some very bizarre trends. One of them I mentioned uh, uh, this morning uh, as well, and I find it a very uh, a dramatic uh, uh, example. It is the, uh, in Africa today, 
one out of two person, they have no electricity. So 50% of Africa, they have no electricity. This is number one fact. Number two, in Africa, you have the, the best solar radiation. 40% of the global solar radiation comes to Africa. Yet, the amount of electricity we generate uh, from solar in Africa is half of the electricity we generate from solar in Netherlands. So just for a moment, think about the map. How big is Africa and the size of uh, Netherlands? How sunny is Netherlands? How sunny is uh, Africa? And half of Africa has no access to electricity. So this is, uh, in my view, dramatic and not to be, uh, not, uh, we can't accept it, at least I can't accept this. So therefore, this is a third challenge I see in front of the clean energy transition, because clean energy transition should not be only for Norway and Switzerland or France or United States, it should be, it should be global, but there is a big issue of the investment in uh, the uh, developing uh, countries. And uh, if this doesn't happen, not only the climate consequences will be uh, very harsh, but at the same time, it is, in my view, it's not fair. And there may be many different uh, consequences of that. Uh, the economic prosperity in the developing countries will be hampered, and this can have several implications from migration to uh, the, the social stability and uh, others. So therefore, there is a role, in my view, of the developed countries, international financial institutions to support the uh, clean energy transition in uh, developing uh, countries. So to sum up, uh, the, there is an optimistic uh, picture that we are seeing a new clean global energy economy is emerging. We have, uh, as it happens, in all the big changes in the world, when we look at the uh, history, because there are a lot of challenges, but three of them I wanted to share with you. One of them is the lack of grids for our electricity system, because I am a person, I believe electricity is the future. And the, but to bring the electricity, clean electricity to consumers, we need to build grids to bring, them, uh, bring it to them. Second, uh, the to build the clean energy technologies, uh, we need critical minerals and manufacturing. Hope, uh, I wish it is more diverse than relying one single uh, country. And third, hopefully we will find ways that the, uh, the investment in the emerging and developing countries uh, will flow uh, much strongly than uh, today, so that we can see that the clean energy transition is not only for the rich countries, but for the uh, entire world, which at the end of the day will really benefit for uh, all of us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Fatih Birol. I know that as we are speaking, uh, the next year's um, budget for Norway is being discussed uh, in the parliament. And I know that one of the topics they are discussing is if we can use some of the revenues from all our oil and gas uh, production to de-risk investments in emerging yeah. economies. So that is one way to handle uh, this. We'll give um, Professor Thomas Carr uh, the floor to ask a question or to give a short comment, and then afterwards, Ida, please. So, uh, I find it very interesting what you say about infrastructures. When we look at this in our own system analysis and, and models, we see a tremendous need for different types of infrastructures. You mentioned electricity grids. Our analysis shows due to intermittent energy production, uh, solar, wind, and so on. Maybe you need to increase four, five, six times the, the, the transmission infrastructure in Europe. That would be a good way to, to deal with this intermittent nature. But we see the same in a number of other areas. We see it uh, with the, the carbon capture and storage, the need to, to, to scale up from millions of tons to maybe gigatons to, to abate industrial uh, emissions. And, and we see it for hydrogen, if we would 
would implement those kind of infrastructures. But then we see also you mentioned de-risking in, in your presentation, and I think even in, in, in Western countries and in Europe, you see the need to de-risk this kind of infrastructure investments. And, and the reason is, in many cases, you need to build the supply side and you need to build the demand side at the same time, and these infrastructures are tremendously expensive. So if, if you look at this from a risk perspective, you have the volume risk, you have the price risk, you have the political risk as well, because you also would need political backups to do this. And you have challenges with, with, with also the acceptance of, of the public. So uh, in, in, your, in, your, uh, in your work, you, you meet a lot of these politicians that will help to de-risk this kind of infrastructure investments in, in, the, in the future. So, so what do you think? How, how should we approach this or next? few years to be able to actually implement at the scale needed those infrastructures. Thank you. Please, Dr. Okay, so this, uh, this is an excellent uh, uh, point. So to be very frank, uh, I believe politicians will not uh, move and take the necessary steps to de-risk those investments, especially in the developing uh, countries, because I give uh, such a speech. Why they would do it is uh, they would, if they understand that the, if they do not de-risk those investments, they themselves, their countries, their economies will be also going to suffer. The point is I am trying to tell them uh, if you do not help the developing countries, we may well all pay for it. How we can, uh, how I'm trying to convince them. First of all, what I try to tell you, in, even in Europe, okay, the big Europe continent, think about the continent, even tomorrow, not even 2050, tomorrow we bring the emissions to zero as of tomorrow which is uh, Wednesday, for the next 30 years, zero. If the, if the other countries would do whatever they are doing uh, today, the impact of climate change in Europe will not change at all. So this is something that we all need to understand. It's a global issue. It is not only with the, of course, I don't want to say that Europe, shouldn't, Europe should do, Norway should do whatever they are doing in terms of their own reducing the emissions, which is setting a very good example, and, uh, both politically and technologically. Uh, but uh, I think uh, the way to convince or try to convince the decision makers, the policy makers are uh, uh, rather going through that it will hurt them if we are not able to uh, de-risk the investments. But I have to make exceptions. So I don't misunderstand me. In some countries, some politicians move without thinking the, this type of things. And uh, uh, I can tell you, your prime minister is one of those who really understands this, that uh, he has a very good uh, heart and he understands the, he is very close to the, the, the sensitive to developing countries uh, that there is a need to move in that uh, direction. But this is an exception. I meet so many people and I have rarely seen that the, any politician will move just for the global uh, uh, reasons rather than uh, their own political or country uh, reasons. So the issue, the solution goes to make them understand that if the world doesn't move, whatever you do alone, even you do the best job, mm -hmm. uh, it will not change the uh, results. <coughs> Thank you. Do you have? Yeah, I have a, and, and it's actually a follow-up question, so yes, it, it suited, uh, suited quite well. And, and I feel uncomfortable. I went to stand up as well. Yeah, yeah very, very good. good. <laughs> 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 understand yeah. that. So, so I mean, uh, over the last 20 years or so, even more, maybe we have seen globalization uh, lead to a tremendous uh, economic growth and increase in welfare in many, many countries over the world. But it's also one of the reasons why we have had low interest rates in, in Europe exactly. and, and, the, and the Western world. And, and what we see now are trends going in the opposite direction in terms of your discussion about uh, critical materials on one side and security supply, but also we see 
uh, also increasingly that uh, investments in renewables and also investments in, in the energy transition in general is, is sort of getting also traces of what you could call trade wars or, um, and national interests going before global interests. And, uh, uh, well, of course, our models are naive in the respect that they don't deal with those kind of aspects. So they come up with solutions that have a global optimum in, in some ways. But in reality, we are seeing, in many respects, the opposite happening. Yeah. So I, I wonder, uh, yeah. first, your reflections on that, yeah. and how can yeah. we avoid that this is hampering both the transition and the welfare? This is. Please okay. share with me if you'd like to. Okay, so, no, no, so <laughs> oh, uh, this is also, uh, first I give you one, uh, I'm sorry, but I again give you one number and then uh, tell what I think about this. In, I mentioned the solar. In uh, China today, the solar manufacturing uh, capacity is working with 40% uh, utilization. It means, what, what it means in real life, there is a, they could have uh, uh, manufactured uh, almost twice more solar panels, but China cannot sell it for the reasons you mentioned, trade barriers. Some countries put trade barriers uh, and they cannot sell it for good or bad reasons. I'm just talking about now the trade very in a naive way. And this is, I see this going to happen uh, everywhere. I mentioned Paris, and we have a COP28 in a, uh, another important uh, climate meeting in a few weeks of uh, time. If I compare Paris and Dubai <coughs> in two weeks of time, I see one advantage we have now in uh, Dubai and one disadvantage. Advantage is today, as I mentioned, many clean energy technologies are much cheaper because 2015 when we had Paris, Neither solar, nor electric cars, nor windmills, they were not so cheap and they were not uh, so much around the world. But the biggest difference, disadvantage, is exactly what you mentioned. When uh, we have uh, Paris, there was an international cooperation was the mood. Mm. Some of you may remember President, uh, President Obama, just a few weeks before the Paris meeting, traveled to Beijing, had a meeting with the, uh, the uh, Chinese president, and the agreement they had was the, uh, the, 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 the basis of an international agreement. But when we look at today, this international cooperation is now uh, replaced by international fragmentation among the countries. There is no uh, cooperation. This is the biggest challenge. And how to overcome this is extremely difficult. What we are trying to do, I, mean, I am traveling to many, many countries, just trying to, I mean, yesterday, just yesterday before coming uh, here, yesterday was Monday, yeah, before coming here, I talked with the Chinese uh, special envoy and who is in charge of the uh, climate change. Uh, she uh, uh, and Norway, next week, uh, Secretary Kerry, just trying to convince them, put aside all the issues for the moment, just focus on the climate change that we can come up with a, a uh, result, but it will be very, very difficult because there are so many uh, vested interests in energy and climate issues, and there are so many political problems we all uh, know around the world. This is a big, big challenge. Thank you. Thank you so much. The next question comes from Ida uh, Doksmit, and uh, she is Senior Research Fellow at the Norwegian Institute of International Affairs. Please, Ida. Are you Hi. sitting or standing? <laughs> okay, I stand as well. No, 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 it's okay. It's okay. No, 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 I'm, I'm fine like this. I am fine like this. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, as Kiris uh, didn't explain, I'm a senior researcher at the Norwegian Institute of International Affairs. So I study energy transition from a political lens. Um, and thank you for the presentation and for being brave enough to pull out three barriers for such a complex problem. Um, I have one question related to critical minerals, a topic that we have worked quite a lot on at uh, the Norwegian Institute of International Affairs. And um, if I can also allow it, I will have a second question as well. Um, so, as you mentioned, there's now quite a lot of focus on critical minerals, yeah. maybe a barrier for uh, energy transition, but, uh, and your response is sort of 
uh, diversification, and I don't think you would disagree with me but on this, but when you look at the literature on critical minerals, uh, a lot of the policy response is not necessarily in, only in diversification, but it's way more on, you know, circular economy, um, on, um, on uh, recycling, uh, and there's also potential, a lot of potential for innovation across the value chain of each in critical minerals. So you really need to dig down in each, you know, for each critical minerals to understand the criticality of that mineral. So it's I, I'm sometimes I'm afraid that we sort of discuss this issue at a very general level, turning it into an energy security issue when it may not be. Um, and in fact, when you look at a lot of the studies, what I also point to is that it may not actually, a lot of these uh, minerals, we will, the supply will be um, sufficient until 2050 and also further, particularly if you take into account mass transit and carpooling and other sort of demand side measures for limiting the growth of, for instance, EVs. So that is a, a comment, but when we're working on this, uh, we realize that uh, access to data is a challenge, challenge, um, both in terms of uh, access to proven reserves, but also trade flows and so on. So I'm just wondering how IEA is working on this and if there can be some sort of an initiative to create better access to data so we can actually have proper, we know what's going on. I, I found one study that argued, for instance, that cobalt, maybe 50% of the trade flow is actually unofficial. So. Yeah. Mm. So, uh, I understand your uh, question first. Thank you very much for working on this. So, I mentioned the uh, critical minerals, the, the, uh, the concentration there, but uh, we can have a few things. One, we can increase the uh, production of this, then this uh, will be, and many countries, this can help to diversification and therefore there will not be a tightness in the uh, markets. This is a, a good thing, but when we look at today the, where the investments come from, in fact, investments come from the country or countries which in fact makes the concentration even stronger. But there are other ways to address this in addition to in other countries looking at the critical uh, minerals and many countries now uh, the woke up, if I may say so, uh, in Australia, in Canada, in the United States, in India, Indonesia, they are looking at their own critical mineral resources, which they have not done so. Many coal companies, the top coal companies around the world, they understand that the coal is going to be weaker. They are transforming themselves to a mining company, critical minerals mining companies, they are working on that. But one other way, to uh, to address this issue is, as you mentioned, the demand side measures. How we can uh, make uh, uh, take steps in order to reduce our uh, reliance on critical minerals, and how we can reuse the critical minerals we have now. There are some uh, measures we have uh, we are working on. And uh, very soon, International Energy Agency will make this critical minerals database public. You will see there lots of data and perhaps the best available data in the world and for anybody, everybody's use. But the issue will not go, and there is one other issue here, I have to mention this. This is the, uh, many of the critical minerals coming from uh, Africa uh, and some other developing countries, there is a, a issue of uh, uh, child labor, which is uh, they are produced in uh, not in a uh, environmental socially acceptable way. And many of the countries around the world do not want to make trade with uh, under those circumstances. But there are one or two countries don't care about this. They go frontal and they got the critical minerals which, uh, for which those issues are not uh, important, uh, which we call ESG issues. Uh, this is a, a critical point as well. Um, thank you. I'll give you a follow-up question, but if anyone in the audience would like to comment or ask a question, uh, please give me a sign, and I have two. Thank you, and okay. just continue. And Thank I'll you so much. Um, and I agree with you, I think that there's still quite a lot of research needed on environmental risk and social risks related to critical minerals. Um, 
I actually, I, when I started doing research on energy transition, I looked at solar <clears throat> and I noticed that every time IEA, you know, published in Energy Outlook, there will be a lot of solar advocates that would say that you will be very um, conservative in your estimates. And I'm just very curious, like over the years, for how, what have you worked on sort of, how do you work on improving your models to ensure that you're able to capture this, you know, massive growth that we've seen in certain technologies such as solar mm -hmm. PV. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Can I take a couple of more? Yes, okay. we'll, yeah. we'll open for some more questions. And I have Bjorn Samset and then uh, Kiki. Uh, please Bjorn first. And then we'll group some questions. If not, we'll Thank run out of time. Please, yeah. Thank you, Dr. Grill. I'll try, I'll try to be fast. My name is Bjorn Samset. I'm a climate researcher in Norway working on the natural science side, so on the physical consequences of climate change. Okay. I also talk a lot with the energy sector. I mean, talking to the energy sector now about emissions reductions and the green transition is easy. But talking with them about the actual physical consequences of climate change and how they will feed back on the infrastructure of energy production is very difficult. So my claim, which no one has been able to disprove yet, is that there is not a single energy company that has taken the actual consequences of one and a half or two degrees into their strategies. So my question to you is, uh, is, is this taken part uh, into the IAA strategies yeah. or are you seeing the same issue? Thank you. Thank you very much for your insight. My name is Kiki Kleven. I'm the director of the Bjorken Center for Climate Research. Uh, I want to ask, we're in the middle of a green transition and we're a small, heavily oil producing country. And yet despite every new climate report that comes, even internally produced knowledge in Norway, um, the Norwegian government wants to still develop, still to explore and exploit for more oil. Do you think that the Norwegian government and Norway is basically gambling on the fact that we will not have a successful climate summit, not successful climate deals in the future? Thank you. Yes, let's see if so we I get the diplomatic <laughs> answer here. Or no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> it is, it is, uh, I, 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 no favor, uh, no fear. So no. This, this is our motto. <laughs> So maybe I start with the last uh, uh, the, uh, question. So it is uh, up to every country, up to every company to decide what they are going to do. But I can tell you that we are seeing the oil, you mentioned the oil. I can talk about oil, but all other uh, fossil fuels uh, are the same. Their uh, demand will peak within this decade, even with the current policies, and start to decline. How steep the decline will be, depending on the how strong the governments push the clean energy technologies. It's the electric cars, it is the solar, this is that. But one thing is clear, the oil demand in the world will peak within this Decade. This is uh, what we are seeing, and the many other uh, institutions uh, have a similar uh, view. Now, here, it is up to governments to see, uh, or the companies to see, whether they want to still bet on the fact that the decline after the peak is a steep one or not. If the government or the companies believe that the decline is a smooth one, they may well continue to produce oil. In my view, any company, but any company, any government cannot say on one hand, if I have a company, oil company, if, if the company strategy says, I am going to increase my oil production in the next, I don't know, several years by five million barrels per day. And at the same time, I am uh, my company, I am as the CEO of this company, I believe in reaching Paris climate goals. Both of them cannot be true. They have to choose one of them. It doesn't work. 
it, it, mathematics, it is just a simple, uh, I mean, just you don't need to be a very clever uh, researcher or you, you just, uh, it, it doesn't work. We have to choose uh, one of them. So uh, this is a choice and uh, I believe uh, the, it is uh, the, uh, the, this is the current situation is a, a, the, a, the moment of truth for many governments, many companies, what they are uh, uh, trying to do. And we at the IEA, uh, we have a lot of friends in the companies, in the governments, but we always say what the truth is. The truth is, in my view, you cannot do both of them. You cannot say both of them. You have to choose one of them. Unfortunately, it is the uh, story. The second uh, question, the impact of climate change on the energy sector. This is a very important resilience of the energy sector. Uh, if I can make it, under, make it a bit more concrete for some of us who don't work on this as uh, our colleague uh, uh, does. In Norway, or in, let's put, don't talk about Norway, it is easier, talk about China. In <laughs> China today, one of the reasons why Chinese government says they want to build coal plants is because of the number of dry years for hydro is mm. increasing. So two years ago in China, there were uh, several blackouts and they were caught unprepared. And in China, blackout is a big thing. It has many implications. So Chinese government is uh, scared uh, that another dry year may lead to some uh, serious consequence. And they say, for the sake of security, we are building coal plants. We will not use it if the year is not dry. Why it is becoming dry? It is because it is, a, of course, uh, the climate change plays a very important role here. Another example uh, I give you from France, uh, where I live. For the colleagues who know the thermal power plants or nuclear power plants, you have to. Uh, there are some uh, towers. You have to. Uh, the, uh, you have to uh, uh, cool down the waters with the water coming from the uh, the rivers or uh, the sea or, or uh, whatever. But now the the temperature of the river is so hot that you cannot cool it down, mm. and it is it becomes uh, rather risky if you cannot cool down those uh, towers, and then uh, they hit to stop the running of the power plants because you don't have the the cool water normally you should have in order to cool down the uh, the uh, the uh, the uh, power plants so there are many other examples uh, uh, like that especially uh, we have seen for the offshore uh, applications uh, the extreme weather events uh, can uh, be a uh, uh, devastating for the uh, critical energy infrastructure. And uh, if you ask uh, me whether or not the energy industry is prepared for that, my answer is uh, absolutely not. There is no, uh, uh, there is no, uh, 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 there is no awareness, or if there is awareness, there are not concrete steps uh, there. The last question about the solar, uh, yes, uh, as I said, uh, uh, dear colleague, we believe, I told you, I, I don't know if it is good enough for you, solar will be the queen of power sector. I don't know what you want more than the queen, I should say, but it is, it is, it is, the, it is the, we think uh, solar is uh, going to be the most dominant source of electricity generation uh, in the world. Climate change, policies or not, because it is cheaper, it is much more accessible, and you build a solar panel only in two, three years of time maximum, and it is going to generate electricity around the world. And uh, this is, uh, if the trade barriers, as our colleague uh, mentioned here, is addressed, if there was a free trade around the world, it would have been even much uh, uh, faster. So solar is uh, definitely uh, going to be the uh, source of electricity generation uh, for the world in the next years uh, to come. Um, Birol, I think we have time for one or two questions more. On the way, one question that has been raising here in Norway, even we have a lot of hydropower, is the dark horse nuclear power. 
And we see in China, there are tremendous increase in um, producing nuclear power plants together with wind and solar. So I know that your company, IA, are very conservative on the future for nuclear from 5, 6 to 10, 11 percent of the energy mix. But do we see the tremendous investment in China. I think it was one nuclear plant almost every month. What would that mean for the future in, let's see, 2040? Thank Have you any comments on Thank that? Thank you. And then the colleague behind you. Uh, Dr. Bidol, yeah. uh, my name is John Dukestad. I'm a director of wind at Norwegian Energy Partner, so I work with offshore wind. Uh, but, uh, and I have a number of questions to you, but I'll, I'll limit myself to one. <laughs> Um, and that is uh, regarding hydrogen. We speak about transport of electrons. Uh, we do see initiatives around Europe and, and also elsewhere in terms of creating markets for molecules of hydrogen. So how will hydrogen affect the picture that you've uh, shown us uh, in the future and um, towards 2050? Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Bidirol, maybe I could add a, uh, a short comment when it comes to nuclear power, because that would not be that flexible power that we need to balance solar and wind, would it? Please. Is it all? Okay. Yeah. okay thank That's you. all. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. So, uh, maybe I get to nu both nuclear questions uh, 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 at the end. Uh, you mentioned uh, the hydro hydrogen. Now, I can't tell you uh, something. Um, I deal with energy issues, uh, as Eric knows, uh, a couple of uh, um, a couple of decades, I should not years. And I have seen that any energy source, whatever you say, oil, renewables, nuclear, gas, there are different views. Some people like it, some people don't like it. But when it comes to hydrogen, everybody loves hydrogen. So I feel, uh, I mean, in fact, the first hydrogen report, uh, global, uh, we did it at the IEA to look at the, the cost, the technology, and the trends. But I am only thinking that the, maybe our expectations on hydrogen, both in terms of it is uh, when it will be a, a part of our energy system and the amount of hydrogen in our energy system may be a bit too optimistic. Because we have to do a lot of work on hydrogen. Hydrogen will definitely be a part of our energy system. But first, we have to uh, create demand. Second, we have to build the infrastructure. And third, we have to bring the cost down in order to be cost effective. So from uh, that point of view, I would be a positive surprise if hydrogen, especially if you are talking about the uh, clean hydrogen, uh, will have a significant share in our energy system uh, before 2030. So this is uh, maybe a uh, rather uh, conservative work, but this is what I'm saying, because some countries are uh, really having very high expectations from hydrogen. There is no problem with this, but if you have so much high expectation from one energy source, you may think of the others that you, which are closer to you to make a, a, a use of them. So this may be a, a changing the goalpost. When it comes to nuclear, you are uh, completely right. Uh, nuclear is uh, about 10% of the electricity uh, generation today and nuclear is the, the second after hydropower second uh, 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 zero emission source of electricity generation in the world uh, today and after a, a, the uh, Fukushima accident nuclear was uh, the appetite for nuclear was uh, going down but I see now a big interest around the world on uh, nuclear power huge. Nuclear is making a big comeback around the world in three ways. One, building new nuclear power plants, the traditional ones. Second, and this is more important, the extending the lifetime of the existing nuclear power plants by uh, 10 years or so by refurbishment. And third, uh, new technologies, much more flexible, 
much smaller, small modular reactors. There is a lot of work uh, going on uh, uh, there. Uh, Europe, in my view, uh, I like uh, history, uh, the Europe made three strategically historic mistakes when it comes to energy, which we are paying for economic and foreign policy terms. And one of them was, in my view, turning our back in Europe to nuclear power. 25 years ago, uh, uh, the share of nuclear in European electricity generation was 33%. One third was coming from nuclear power. In a few years, it is now going down to 15%, about half of it. Some of the countries didn't build, some of them shut down, uh, whatever. And, but other countries, as you rightly mentioned, uh, they didn't uh, uh, stop. Uh, in the last five years, more than 80% of all new nuclear power plants uh, built in China and Russia. If I can give you one example, nuclear power has started in the United States and, and Japan, and the U.S. has the biggest nuclear capacity by far, but in five or six years of time, China will overtake the United States as the number one nuclear power in the world. So this is something that people like me, who makes his sense dirty with data every day, this is inconceivable. China will be the number one nuclear power capacity in the world. And this is uh, happening, but now uh, the, uh, the countries in France, for example, where I live, President Macron, when he took the office, he said he's going to decrease the share of nuclear power in the French electricity mix. And I remember myself, it is a very bizarre picture, I here to defend nuclear power vis-a-vis -vis the French government. It's a bit strange. Uh, it is, uh, but now France is now, uh, President Macron comes with a huge new wave of building new nuclear power plants, uh, extending nuclear lifetimes, and also with the uh, pushing the SMR, small modular reactors, to make it more uh, flexible uh, for the power uh, systems. Nuclear power is not easy, especially the, the large, uh, the, the traditional nuclear power plants. It requires huge amount of down payment, the first investments. But uh, at the same time, uh, the, the, the building uh, time is very long, and the nuclear industry has a very bad reputation in the Western Europe not to deliver uh, on time and on cost. It's always uh, more expensive. If we see a nuclear comeback, uh, the nuclear industry this time needs to uh, deliver uh, in the uh, Western countries. China is doing much faster, much cheaper, and uh, with a great uh, technology, and so does, I should tell you, uh, Russia. Uh, I, sh I should also uh, mention this uh, as well. Uh, very quickly, uh, what is your view on our ability to deal with the challenge of seasonal storage? Oh, this is another, uh, another very difficult uh, question. Seasonal storage, and also, even not even seasonal, daily, uh, uh, a daily, uh, how we make the daily storage and how we make the demand and the, uh, the supply balance each other is a big problem, big problem. And therefore, what we need here is either through uh, uh, the natural ways, such as using uh, hydropower or having some uh, large-scale uh, batteries uh, around the world. Without this, it will not happen. I give you one example, just uh, I cannot stop myself speaking. <laughs> <laughs> India, a country that I work a lot. You know what is the biggest problem in India today? India has huge amount of solar, and India is going very well in terms of solar. But in India, the, when you see the peak electricity demand is when people come home uh, from work or in the school and so on in the, in the evening, in, in summer, uh, they uh, turn on the air conditioner, which is the number one electricity consumer in India, they turn on the television and this and that when there is no sun. Mm. What are we going to do with it? This is daily. But also in the seasonal one, it is also a big challenge so that the battery storage is uh, very important. And the, we understand once again, in my view, one of the, uh, 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 the forgotten giants of the uh, electricity generation is hydropower. Hydropower can also play a role uh, here and we shouldn't uh, forget it, and, and of course, one, one can never forget when we are in, uh, in uh, Norway. With this, I want to thank you very much, and I have to go to my...
uh, friends waiting uh, for me and thank you very much thank for you so inviting much. me. Thank you thank very you much. So much. Thank you so much. Thank you very much.